my son was missing for mm. a month and wow. I thought he had died. Um, he mm. was on a run and, um, and I could not eat. I could not mm -hmm. sleep. I could not, it was the only, one of the only times I could not like function at work. Mm. I couldn't go to work because, you know, as a parent, it's a much different experience um, mm -hmm. watching somebody that you love slowly kill themselves and mm -hmm. not be able to save them, not to be mm -hmm. able to do anything to stop it. Yeah. And that's where I was at. I felt very, pa that was like the true, for me, I didn't feel so powerless over my addiction, but I felt mm -hmm. totally powerless over this whole situation with him. Mm -hmm. And so I was convinced that he had died. I spent like three days crying nonstop and um, to the point that I hit an emotional bottom in mm -hmm. recovery at 14 months um, in my bedroom, you know, curled up in a ball on my bedroom floor. Mm -hmm. begging and pleading with God to please find him mm -hmm. um, because I had no idea where he was and I thought he was dead. Hello and welcome everybody to the Your Best Self podcast where I get to interview successful and or inspiring people just like KJ Foster who's going to share her story with us of you know being a mother with a son who got addicted to drugs and was also battling you know her own addiction and how she was able to recover from that and then basically become her best self, and then thrive throughout that addiction. So KJ Foster is a resilience expert. She's an author. She's a speaker. She's an entrepreneur. And most importantly, she's also a mother. She has an incredible story to share, you know, about her addiction recovery from, you know, 11 years ago, where I think it's even longer by now that changed absolutely everything. And I would love to hear the story of KJ Foster. So KJ Foster, welcome to the interview. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. So KJ, please share your story again, how you just basically shared with me. Where did it all start and you know, what did you go through? Sure. Um, well, where it all started was you know, back about, oh, I don't even know how long ago, 20 years ago at this point now, I went through a very, very um, difficult divorce. It was very... Mm -hmm. um, contentious. It was, I would classify it as a trauma. Um, it was just a really a difficult experience. I think that anybody that has been through divorce can probably attest to the fact that no matter how, um, no matter how, um, how much, uh, how positive it is, you know, how much you get along and it's a very difficult process to go through, let alone when it's, when it's a traumatic, um, experience. And, and so, you know, I, um, I turned to, to drinking alcohol more and more as a coping mechanism through this experience. I mean, I was at the time like 38, 39 years old, um, had been married for um, almost 20 years at the time. And um, I, you know, come from a family where, um, you know, drinking is very common and, um, you know, people drink a lot, but they're also very, very successful. And as I shared with you earlier, the motto sort of in my family is, you know, um, work hard, play hard. And mm -hmm. so I grew up in this environment with a lot of drinking, but also a lot of success, you know, mm -hmm. definitely instilled in me um, a very strong work ethic, very strong values. But this drinking thing was a big part of the culture mm -hmm. of my family. And so what happened through this experience of the divorce is that my drinking took on kind of this whole new meaning and that I was using it to mm -hmm. cope with the, the feelings and the, um, and the fear and the, all these things that were happening. And, and um, one of my sons, who was a young teenager at the time, was also turning to alcohol and drugs as this coping mechanism. And what happened is that our uh, path, you know, our uh, progression of our substance abuse into addiction kind of paralleled each other and fed off of each other. So as he would have more difficulty get into trouble, you know, with his drug use, I drank more as a result of that. And so it finally culminated in me um, 
getting sober in 2008 mm -hmm. and um, after struggling to, to try and um, get sober for a number of years, it wasn't until 2008 when I, when I had gotten a DUI that mm -hmm. it really, um, that was the, the event that solidified to me in my mind that this is really an issue, KJ, you have to get a mm -hmm. hold of this, you need to do something. And, um, and that's when my recovery journey began. And my, my son, though, um, however, his addiction progressed and got even worse during the first year of my recovery, which is, which is common, by the way, in families where there's dual addiction going on. As one person gets better, often the other person will get worse. And thank God, you know, he got sober um, 14 months into my recovery. And when he got sober, a couple of months after that, I met my husband. Mm -hmm. So my husband, I'm approaching 12 years of um, sobriety and my husband is approaching 17 years of sobriety. And when I met my husband, he was in, um, he had just gotten his master's degree in, men in mental health counseling, rehab counseling actually, mm -hmm. and was going on to get his PhD. And he was the one who encouraged me and said, you know, um, cause I had such a passion at this point for helping other, other people, mm -hmm. other people who were struggling with addiction. He said, why don't you go back to school, update your master's degree and pursue this. Mm -hmm. um, so I changed careers completely. I was wow. in the hospitality industry for a number of years, and I really just decided as the result of my own recovery that I wanted to help other people recover. Mm -hmm. Because not only did I want to help other people recover, I wanted to help them to be able to see that they could not only uh, recover from this addiction experience, but they could become better than they ever, ever were before. Because like I said, you know, I came from, um, I come from a family that's very successful and, um, and, and yet, you know, I, w and, and I was, you know, uh, for the most part, very successful, even, you know, throughout my addiction, I always was able to go to work, you know, and that's another, you know, miss, um, myth kind of about, uh, people who, you know, suffer from addiction and struggle with addiction is that, you know, that they live under the bridge and they're, mm. you know, so down and out. And there are people walking around showing up for work every single yeah. day that are, that are, you know, in the depths of hell, so to mm -hmm. speak, yeah. struggling with their, with their addiction. And so I always was able to get up for work, show up for mm -hmm. work, um, but clearly not at my best. Mm -hmm. Because what I discovered through my recovery is that um, even though I was seemingly uh, high functioning, you know, that's mm -hmm. what they call it. Oh, you are high yeah. functioning, you know, mm -hmm. um, alcoholic. And the fact of the matter is, is that um, I, I, I guess I was high functioning. But I didn't realize until after... Uh, I was, you know, into my recovery for a couple of years that I could be so much better than mm -hmm. I ever was before my addiction. So yeah. because I was living in this environment of work hard, play hard, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't realize that the playing hard was really taking away from my ability to be my best self mm -hmm. and, um, and that my recovery has created this, um, you know, has empowered my true self mm -hmm. and made it possible for me to be better than I ever, ever was before. So I wanted to share that with other people. I wanted mm -hmm. to share with people that, you know, there, there's not only this possibility for you to recover, but you can actually become a better version of yourself. You can become better than you, than you ever were before the addiction. Yeah. And, and one thing that I wanted to point out too, is that, is that, you know, addiction is an experience. Okay. Yeah. It's an illness. And so many people look at um, individuals who struggle with addiction as they're, oh, they're just an addict. They're just mm -hmm. an alcoholic. There are this, there are that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that really damages a, a person's ability to, to recover in some cases, because mm -hmm it is not who the person is, you know, yeah. it is an experience that they're having. It's an illness that they're experiencing. And it's an illness that you can not only recover from, but you can absolutely become better than you ever, mm. ever were before. Yeah. 
Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And uh, congratulations, obviously, on uh, turning almost 12 years into recovery. And you know, your, your husband's 17 years. That's absolutely amazing. So what I would like to know is, when is something considered an addiction rather than just a bad habit? Well, it's all about the consequences, mm -hmm. right? So there are plenty of people out there who are, you know, drinking and using drugs to mm -hmm. access, probably, mm -hmm. um, but not uh, seemingly experiencing any consequences. And that's yeah. sort of the trickiness when it comes mm -hmm. to um, addiction is that, you know, uh, I guess the, the, the difference between substance abuse mm -hmm. and addiction is that when you cross over, I call it like crossing over mm -hmm. into addiction because, um, you know, the, the difference uh, to me is that you start to um, drink or drug against your own will, even, mm -hmm. you know, in your mind, you're, you know, that you need to stop or that this isn't really mm -hmm. healthy for you. And, and um, it, it's becoming, you know, an issue in your life, but you keep doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, another classic uh, sort of symptom that you've crossed over into addiction is that you start to experience consequences yet you don't change your behavior right mm -hmm. so you're faced with a crisis you're faced mm -hmm. with getting fired from a job you're mm -hmm. faced with a health issue and yet you still don't change your behavior mm -hmm. that is really that key difference between somebody who may be like a you know just a heavy drinker or a problematic drinker or somebody who's using drugs recreationally to somebody where you're faced with this life issue and yeah. and and it's a consequence or it's a problem and you yet you continue to drink or drug mm -hmm. despite those consequences mm -hmm. and when was the time for you where i obviously shared that in the story where you sort of had this you know crossing over point where you realize all right it is an addiction. It is not just something that I do uh, here and there, but it actually is an addiction and I need help. When, when did you realize that? Well, it's, it's hard to like really pinpoint when mm -hmm. I realized that because addiction versus substance abuse, because part of the mental illness is that it's an illness that tells you you don't have it. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. especially if you've been somebody, it, I think sometimes it's easier when you are like, I mean, maybe not when you're a young person. Mm -hmm. So like I can compare like my son to myself. So my son, I think genetically, there was a common genetically predisposed because um, his father is mm -hmm. an addict. And so being genetically predisposed and then also experiencing trauma mm -hmm. escalated that. But he's, he was always somebody who, from the moment he put a drink or a drug in his body, he was not high functioning. There was no going to school. There was no holding down a job. There was no, it was mm -hmm. like pedal to the metal from mm -hmm. day one. Yeah. So whereas for me, I was able to drink, you know, socially for a number of years. Did I have periods in my life where maybe I was thinking, you know, abusing more mm -hmm. than social? Um, yes. But mm -hmm. like I said, I was always able to work and function, have a family, mm -hmm. all of that. So when it started to become an issue is very soon, interestingly enough, you know, my divorce was the result of my, my ex-husband's alcohol use. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. was a contributing factor to the divorce. And at that time, I didn't have a problem with alcohol. Mm -hmm. It was his problem, you know, mm -hmm. not my problem. And it yeah. wasn't until the divorce occurred and I started, I found myself starting to use alcohol um, more and more that I on my own decided mm -hmm. this is, you know, this isn't going heading in a good direction. Mm -hmm. I'm drinking more. I need to do something about this. And I chose to enter Alcoholics Anonymous at the time. Mm -hmm without having suffered any consequences other than you know, looking at myself in the mirror and going, oh my God, this, you mm -hmm. know, you're out of control. This is bad. Mm -hmm. And because I hadn't suffered any other consequences externally, they were all internal, you know, mm -hmm. to me, it was very easy to compare myself out because I heard other people's stories and they were all so like, me horrific mm -hmm. and people yeah. getting arrested and people you know doing like really um crazy things as a result of their addiction so i thought to myself i'm different you know mm -hmm. i'm not as bad as this person that person 
So I struggled, you know, um, kind of going in and out of the program for five years because mm. I hadn't experienced any true external consequences until my DUI. Okay. And when I got my DUI was when, um, because I would say to my, my family, my, my mm -hmm. drinking family, remember mm -hmm. my, my yeah. family, that this hard, is play hard. a <laughs> big part of the culture. Mm -hmm. I would say to them, you know, uh, I'm going to AA, like, I really think I have a problem with my drinking. And they, unlike a lot of families would say mm -hmm. to me, no, you're fine. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> you're working, yeah. you're single uh -huh. mom, you're taking care of your kids. You're mm -hmm. like, you're fine. Everybody gets out mm -hmm. of hand every once in a while, you know, yeah. you're okay. So I'm going, oh, okay. I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it wasn't until I got my DUI that I was finally able to mm. say to my family, um, I think <laughs> I may actually have a problem here. Yeah. And so I entered back into the recovery program and uh, and as I said, my son was getting worse. And at the time I thought to myself, you know, I'm on probation for nine months. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get my act together. I'm gonna clean up. And then nine months when I'm off probation, I'm done, you know, I'm good. I'll like mm -hmm. go on with my life and, and go back to drinking maybe, you know, but I was committed to, I'm on probation for nine months. Mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna abide by the rules and mm -hmm. I'm not gonna drink. And even though I found it really, really hard and this is when I knew this is the crossover point, okay? Mm -hmm. So I had, so this is a roundabout way. So yeah, like, no I'm worries. getting there. Uh -huh. So, but in talking about it, I'm starting to realize that this was mm -hmm. the turning point. So I don't know if you're familiar with the, cause um, where are you located, Robert? In Germany. You're Germany. in Germany. So mm -hmm. in the States, okay, mm -hmm. when you get a DUI, um, mm -hmm. it was my first DUI, but because my blood alcohol level was mm -hmm. so high, okay. um, I was mandated to have a, um, a blower in my car. Do you have those in Germany? Uh, yes, we do also have those in Germany. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I had the blower in my car. And so I thought to myself, okay, well, I just won't drink and drive. You know, this mm -hmm. is how the, the mental mm -hmm. illness is still like, um, you're not that yeah. bad. Uh -huh. And, and so I went to uh, my boyfriend's house, the, a man mm -hmm. that I was dating at the time, and had a couple of glasses of wine the night mm -hmm. before, but I was being good. I had like mm -hmm. two glasses of wine, right? So mm -hmm. to me, that's like, that's nothing. That's fine, yeah. Uh -huh. And I get up in the morning to go start my car and because it detects any alcohol, or even overnight, like it stays okay. in your body for a long time, mm -hmm. it shut down my car. Oh, wow, And I couldn't really? drive my car for like 10 hours. It literally locks wow. your car down. So if wow. it detects the alcohol, it's the uh -huh. greatest thing ever. I hated it at the time. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I, I hate this thing. You know, it's horrible, mm -hmm. but it saved, I believe it saved my life. Yeah. So wow. it was at, at that moment where I'm standing outside of my car and it's in lockdown and I can't drive it that I thought to myself, this, you, you have a problem because mm. you're being told you're being told you have a problem you've got a blower device in your car yeah. so that you don't start your car when you mm -hmm. you know if you are under the influence of alcohol and and look at what happens so yeah. you know that was a turning point for me mm -hmm. in terms of recognizing that i really needed to do something more drastic than just mm -hmm. sort of playing around with the program you know, I yeah. really needed to commit myself mm -hmm. to like doing the steps and getting mm -hmm. the sponsor and doing all that. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I did it. But I still said to myself, I'm only going to do this for nine months until yeah. I'm off probation. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is my son got worse. Mm -hmm. And that was a turning point for me because mm -hmm. when he got sober, it was, um, it was after a, um, very, uh, a very, I, the only way that I can describe it is this, this was like my spiritual awakening. You know, mm -hmm. they talk about, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, 12 step recovery, mm -hmm. but you know, there's this, this concept of the spiritual awakening and um, my son was missing for mm -hmm. a month wow. and I thought he had died. Um, he mm -hmm. was on a run and, um, and I could not eat. I could not mm -hmm. sleep. I could not, it was the only, one of the only times I could not like function at work mm. and go to work because, you know, as a parent, it's a much different experience um, mm -hmm. watching somebody that you love slowly kill themselves and mm -hmm. not be able to 
save them, not to be mm -hmm. able to do anything to stop it. Yeah. And that's where I was at. I felt very, that was like the true, for me, I didn't feel so powerless over my addiction, but I felt mm -hmm. totally powerless over this whole situation with him. Mm -hmm. And so I was convinced that he had died. I spent like three days crying nonstop and um, to the point that I hit an emotional bottom in mm -hmm. recovery at 14 months um, in my bedroom, you know, curled up in a ball on my bedroom floor, mm -hmm. begging and pleading with God to please find him mm -hmm. um, because I had no idea where he was and I thought he was dead. Mm -hmm. and, and in this conversation with God, I said to God, you know, God, whatever happens, if he dies, if he's dead and, you know, another, like, even though I don't get, you know, why things happen in the world, why bad things happen, mm -hmm. that if another person lives because he died, you know, and learns from this, then, then, then I get it somehow, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to drink either way. Like yeah. if he lives or dies, I promise you, I'm not going to drink either mm -hmm. way. And I went to bed that night after having that conversation with God in tears and slept for the first time in three days, wow. better than I had slept my whole 14 months of sobriety. And I woke up to my sponsor at the time mm -hmm. calling me my very first call of the morning, mm -hmm. literally woke up to my phone ringing and she had found him wow. at a local sleeping outside of a local bookstore. Mm. And to me, that was, there was no doubt in my mind that um, God, what I believe to be God, you know, um, exists and heard yeah. my prayer. And so when I went to go meet with him, because I said to her, keep him there, don't let mm -hmm. him go anywhere. He was high at the time. And mm -hmm. I begged him to let me take him to detox. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't come because, um, somebody owed him five dollars he wanted to go get his five dollars basically he wanted to go get high again yeah and um and in that moment watching him walk away he said to me i'll call you tomorrow mom and i knew he wasn't going to call me you know tomorrow um i was at such peace in watching him walk away that day um because i knew that you know, he was in God's hands. Like I had no control yeah. over the situation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I, yet I could, I could go about my day. I, I have, you know, another child and I, I could take care of him and mm -hmm. go to work. And I was totally at peace at a peace yeah. I had not ever felt before. And he called me a week later and asked mm -hmm. me to pick him up. And, um, and that was the beginning of his journey to recovery. Mm -hmm. And, when I, when he called me and I picked him up and I went to a meeting that night, there was a woman at the meeting who said to me, KJ, don't you think that for you to pick up a drink, um, after, after what happened, after, you know, finding, uh, your son and, and his, you know, him recovering on all of this, don't you think that picking up a drink at this point would be kind of like slapping God in the face. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, Oh man, like any thought I had of having a drink just totally got like, wiped yeah. out. Uh -huh. like that's the way that I really have felt about it, that mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for my recovery. I'm so grateful for his recovery that to me, picking up a drink today is mm -hmm. like, would be yeah. completely like yeah. insane. Yeah. So, that was, that was really a turning point for me in terms of being committed to this, um, you know, just really not just being sober, but really mm -hmm. living like the best life I can possibly live, like really contributing to life mm -hmm. rather than taking, you know, mm -hmm. it was like when the shift happened for me of, you know, life being all about like, you know, what I can get and what I can achieve. And even though mm -hmm. I feel like I've definitely achieved way more than I ever imagined that I would ever achieved, achieve, it's based upon this, this whole um, mindset of giving, you know, mm -hmm. of giving back to people, of helping people, of restoring their hope and their faith mm -hmm. and, 
and helping them to become better than yeah. they ever imagined they could be. Mm, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. It, I, I really felt that because obviously I, I am not a parent. I cannot, you know, uh, imagine how it is being in that situation. I just know how it was for my mom as I was in the US, uh, you know, abroad for a whole year and got into a horrible car accident. And, you know, then my host mom called my mother and told her that I was in the hospital basically and under surgery, how she must have felt at that moment yes. where she was completely helpless. She couldn't you know, get over there and it was completely out of her control. So I cannot imagine how hard it must be for a parent seeing his child, he seeing his son in that state and not knowing obviously where he was and thinking that he died. It, Mm -hmm. that's that's unimaginable for me so i condemn you for you know being able to stay strong at that time because i believe that especially in that time you also said that kind of like turning to drinking was a way of coping with the trauma coping with the difficulties mm -hmm. that you have in life and escaping mm -hmm. sort of this reality right so right. probably like one of those moments where you knew like he was gone and you don't know where he is probably a lot of people would have picked up drinking again, but you didn't, right? right? right. So what, what, what gave you the strength in, in that time of, you know, not picking up a drink again? Well, one of the, one of the things that, that I teach to mm -hmm. um, the people that I work with is that there are three critical elements that you need in order to successfully recover. Yeah. And, and one of them is, is a mentor is mm -hmm. somebody where you can follow in their footsteps, you mm -hmm. know, somebody that has achieved what, um, what you are seeking to achieve. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I cover, I, I teach actually, you know, uh, six elements, which mm -hmm. I cover in my book, The Warrior's Guide to Successful Sobriety. But there, out of those six, there are really three that, like, I, I believe are absolute musts. Like, you really need to have these in order to, like, you could stay abstinent, but what I'm talking about is to successfully recover and become, like, yeah. the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so the mentor is, is one of them, but also there's what I call the tribe, which is mm -hmm. the support group. And yeah. so... So especially for me during this time, the support group was critical. And I remember, and, and, and I'm somebody, even though 12-step recovery um, it is something that worked for me, it was really the only option. You know, mm -hmm. there, at the time that I got sober, there, I didn't know of any other like programs. There mm -hmm. are so many more now, which I think is great because um, it's hard for a lot of people to get 12 step recovery, mm -hmm. especially if you've had like a bit of a higher bottom, you know, I yeah. think for people who have, have really low bottoms, it's mm -hmm. definitely, you know, um, uh, super effective. So having this, um, this tribe, this support mm -hmm. group that was behind me, because at nine months sober, I started going to Al-Anon, which mm -hmm. is the, you know, the family, the uh, family members, it's a 12 step program for family members. Okay. And I was so resistant, like people were telling me from the very beginning, you know, KJ, you need to go to Al-Anon, KJ, you need to go mm -hmm. to Al-Anon. And I was like, whoa, like I, I, all I can handle is like this mm -hmm. AA thing right now, you know, mm -hmm. but I would go to meetings like every single day and cry about my son, mm -hmm. my son, my son. And they would be like, you know, you're in the wrong fellowship here. You need to go mm -hmm. to him. I'm like, no, I'm yeah. not. <laughs> so um, it wasn't until I was in enough pain mm -hmm. and desperate enough, which is, Mm -hmm. really like you know what it takes for most people yeah. to to enter any kind of program mm -hmm. that i that i decided you know okay i'm gonna try this al-anon thing and mm -hmm. what happened very first meeting i went to was really amazing because the the person who was sharing was a son um talking about his mother and mm -hmm. the effect of her you know drinking on his life which was just mm -hmm sort of very um, eye-opening to me mm -hmm. in and of itself. But after I had the opportunity to, to share what I was going through, and this was a time where my son was getting into so much trouble, mm -hmm. you know, he was like, you know, getting into my house um, mm -hmm. when I wasn't there, when he wasn't supposed to be, you know, things mm -hmm. like that over and over again. And so this, this gentleman came up to me after the meeting and he said to me, um, he said to me, do you, he did something which I call, um, you know, he patted me on the back and sort of slapped me in the face all at the same time. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> right? So, 
so he, he was saying to me, you know, KJ, you know, you, you really need to, um, to set some like boundaries for mm -hmm. your son, because what I didn't realize is I was doing things that were actually enabling him mm -hmm. that, that I, you know, wasn't aware of, like allowing him to continue to, you know, not forcing him to go to treatment, things like that. So he mm -hmm. said to me, listen, you need to set some boundaries with him, you know, um, uh, for him to get better. I have a son. He went through the same thing. He's now recovered. He's, you know, married, has kids. So he gave me hope, you know, mm -hmm. like his son went through the same thing. And then he said, these are the things you have to do. You know, you yeah. can't let him live with you if he's, if he's using drugs. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, what, what are you suggesting? Like, I can't mm -hmm. kick him out. Like I yeah. love him. And he said to me, KJ, you're going to love him to death. Mm -hmm. if you don't start to set some boundaries. So that was like the slapping yeah. me in the face. And then he says, but you just said you, you just celebrated nine months, right? Mm -hmm. Of sobriety. And I said, yeah. And he said, do you realize how freaking amazing that is? Mm -hmm. Like all that you're going through with your mm -hmm. son and that you have not picked up a drink or a drug in nine months. Mm -hmm. He goes, that is amazing. And yeah. I hadn't even thought about it for like, I was mm -hmm. so focused for nine months on just getting through the day, just getting through mm -hmm. the day. You know, that was my life for mm -hmm. the first like year and a half of wow. recovery. I feel like a year, a year, you know, like mm -hmm. 14 months, just get through the day, KJ, just get through the day. And he was like, that's amazing. And I was like, I stopped for a moment. And I was like, yeah, yeah. That, mm -hmm. that's pretty amazing. But it was my mm -hmm. support group. Like when I did have to kick him out of the house mm -hmm. and say, listen, you can't live here which resulted in him then missing for a oh, month. Yeah. So mm -hmm. of course, you know, I'm, that was the hardest thing that mm -hmm. I ever did because there are people who have done that and their loved ones have died, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like thinking to myself, I just killed my son. You know, I, yeah. just, like, I did it like mm -hmm. this is, and there were, there were a group of people supporting me that were telling me, listen, you did the right thing. He wouldn't go to treatment. You had to do this. I filed a Marchman mm -hmm. Act, which I don't know, um, it, if they have those in Germany where you can mm. mandate your loved one into treatment, things mm, like that. Yeah. Don't know. I don't know about that. Mm. Yeah. So that's something that I ultimately, you know, mm -hmm. um, had to do, which helped him to get sober, which is a whole mm -hmm. another part of the story. But, um, I filed a Marchman Act. So I had to do all of these things that as a parent, so scary. Yeah. So like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Am I doing mm -hmm. the right thing? Because even though I am a religious person, my concept of spirituality is all about mindset. It's all about going from this place of hopelessness, shame, despair, mm -hmm. resentment, anger, you know, all of these negative, like, mm -hmm. um, emotions that are sucking the power out of you and, yeah. and creating this, this mm -hmm. place of powerlessness to courage, you know, mm -hmm. and, compassion and understanding and love and forgiveness and all of those like higher vibration emotions. So when I talk spirituality, I'm talking about mindset. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And, and you just said, you know, where you go, you know, a lot of it is about mindset, obviously. And that, that's what I want to touch upon um, a little bit more. And a lot of it is about obviously beliefs and, you know, limiting beliefs sort of that you have in your mind all the time. And you've been talking a little bit more spirituality and that's what I want to touch upon. So you said you sort of changed the beliefs and the mindset from, you know, all this negative, all this draining energy to, to the positives. And like, how did you go about doing that? Obviously, you had a support group which helped you. You had mentors who helped you. But did you read any other additional books or did you, you know, got into courses that helped you change those beliefs? Sure. I mean, uh, as a part of the 12-step the program, you, you, you know, you do the steps, which are mm -hmm. a process. I believe it's a, a shame-reducing process, a big part of it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but as a as a part of going through those steps, it is, it is um, teaching you to go from this place of hopelessness, resent, especially resentment and anger, you know? Um, and I think self-pity is a, is a big one that, that people struggle with yeah. because addiction in and of itself is, you know, addiction is a mental illness. Mm -hmm. And as a mental illness, it takes, there's not one single person that you're going to find who's in active addiction mm -hmm. that is not in a place of hopelessness, despair, negativity, 
you mm -hmm. know, um, anger, resentment, blame, all mm -hmm. of those things. So there, so for me, the 12 steps were a process of helping me start to go from this place of negativity to this place of courage, mm -hmm. this place of hope, this place of unconditional love. Like that's mm -hmm. one of the, you know, um, it's one of the, um, sort of, um, mottos, so to speak, I mm -hmm. can't think of the word, but it's, you know, 12 step recovery is all about practicing, yeah. you know, unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that was part of it. And, and there are other programs that, you know, that help you get there as well. But for me, it was the 12 steps. And mm -hmm. I think it was through my education, like going back and getting my PhD and, mm -hmm learning so much more about addiction as a brain disease and how it works. I read a book that absolutely blew my mind and, okay. and, and in a, because it for me solidified everything that I already believed about mm -hmm. addiction and recovery. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden I read this book and it was like a, yes, you're right, KJ. Mm -hmm. This is what, and it's called power versus force by Dr. Okay. David Hawkins. Mm -hmm. and it's amazing because it, it's all about this this um, this concept of spirituality in terms of you know um, negative thoughts you know mm -hmm. and and positive thoughts and and learning how you know our our thinking everything's connected you mm -hmm. know so like there's this there's this motto or I, there's another word for it that I'm not <laughs> thinking of at the yeah. moment uh, like phrase in mm -hmm. in addiction recovery, um, especially particularly twelve step recovery where they say act yourself into act yourself into right thinking because service mm -hmm. is a mm -hmm. big part of the recovery process yeah. you know volunteering and helping other mm -hmm. people that's the, mm -hmm. the core the core of mm -hmm. the twelve step program is one alcoholic helping another alcoholic, yeah. one addict helping another addict. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's doing service. And mm -hmm. so when you think of that concept of acting your way into right thinking, it's all mm -hmm. about how connected everything is. So what I think, right, mm -hmm. impacts how I feel and how yes. I feel impacts what I do, yes. right? So just as much as what I do will mm -hmm. impact how I feel and mm -hmm. then what I think. So by doing service and helping others, you're creating self-esteem. Mm. You're creating good feelings about mm -hmm. yourself, which then impacts how you think about yourself. Yeah. But another book that I read that was uh, pivotal in my recovery mm -hmm. was The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so learning, you know, starting to practice meditation and you know, prayer and meditation. I was not a big meditator in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't really view mindfulness as meditation. I always mm -hmm. kind of thought of meditation as this like long, you know, you got to get the candles, you have to get <laughs> the music, you have to do it for like a yeah. super long period of time. Mm -hmm. And um, when I read The Power of Now um, and learned about mindfulness, I suffered from a lot of anxiety, which is mm -hmm. very common in early recovery. And I, I want to say I was like six months sober when I read this book. I can't re mm -hmm. really remember when it was, but I remember reading it and thinking to myself, because it, it, he talks about how, you know, it's all about what's going on up here, yes. that it's impacting your reality, you mm -hmm. know? And so he suggests in this book that you go through this like 24 hour period where you monitor like mm -hmm. what you're really, because, you know, you become that third party observer of yeah. self, because mm -hmm. most people go about their day and they, they don't even think like yeah, it's exactly. autopilot right? Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. people are autopilot. They're not thinking about how what they're thinking is influencing mm -hmm. what's going on around them. Yeah. So he made this suggestion like, so for 24 hours, just be, try to be as mindful as you can about mm -hmm. what your thought process is. So I made this commitment to do that. <laughs> and that next morning I wake up, you know, to get ready for work. And by the time I get out of the shower, I'm in full blown anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I start to realize that I'm in mm -hmm. full blown anxiety because of the thoughts that are going on yeah. in my mind. I'm mm -hmm. like worrying about at this point in time, I was still going through this like mm -hmm. horrible contentious divorce. And I'm thinking about g having to go in, you know, before mm -hmm. the judge. And I'm thinking all these thoughts that are creating my anxiety yeah. and nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. Nothing has happened. All I've gotten out of bed. 
to get yeah. ready for work and nothing yeah. is going on except what's going on mm -hmm. in my head. Yeah. And so I created these mantras mm -hmm. that once I realized I was going into this negative mindset, mm -hmm. it was like, oh, insert tape, you know, mm -hmm. and I would just start repeating these mantras in my head over and mm -hmm. over again until my mind shifted out yeah. of this negative, you know, I was going down the negative path again. Mm -hmm. No, oh, oh, no, no, let's turn yeah. and go this way. Uh -huh. And it's, I, you know, share with people that it's not an easy thing to do because people will say, oh, no, I can't do, I wish I could do that. I can't do, I just yeah. can't control my thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, you, you can't, like, if you've never done it before, mm -hmm. it's like sitting down to play the piano when you've mm -hmm. never practiced. Exactly. You're not going mm -hmm. to be able to play, right? Yeah. You can't play. You need to practice over and over and over again so that what happens is then mm -hmm. ultimately you'll sit down at the piano and you'll be able to play without the music effortless, mm -hmm. effortlessly it'll become a part of who you are yeah. and that's what mindset training is mm -hmm. all about it's all about practicing 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 shifting the thoughts mm -hmm. until it becomes a natural part of who you are yeah. And the negative thinking becomes so uncomfortable mm -hmm. that you're like, oh, you know, you're aware of it right mm -hmm. away. But it takes yeah. a lot of practice and commitment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. And I didn't want to stop anything of what you just shared because you were just so in the flow of doing that. And I, uh, I created a bunch of videos about, you know, how the mind and how your thoughts, you know, basically shape your reality and, you know, everything around in your life, because that's literally how you create your reality by what you think all the time and how it makes you feel right so right. i love the fact that you shared that because i believe that for a lot of people that might be living right now and as you said most of the people are living on autopilot they're like merely existing throughout their day instead of actually living it you know consciously so mm -hmm. I, I just you know love the fact that you shared so much about why it's so important to be aware of your thoughts and direct those thoughts and realize hey like all right i'm i'm constantly going into the negative side of things. So let me just, you know, pull that back and, you know, move that into the positive ones. And you also mm -hmm. shared that you've been using mantras, right? So every single time you were like, all right, there is something negative going on. You reaffirmed yourself with a mantra, a positive affirmation, mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of like went into the positive side of things, right? Right. Do you mind sharing, you know, um, one or two mantras that you've been using, which you've been um, using all the time to sort of get you back onto the right track? Sure. One of the mantras that um, I started to use is I am calm and confident mm -hmm. because the anxiety was so mm -hmm. um, was so great for me so yeah. that I'm calm and confident. I'm calm mm -hmm. and confident until, you know, I started mm -hmm. getting. And then another one that I use is um, I, I attract, uh, I attract positive prosperity. Um, I am a magnet for mm -hmm. prosperity. I am a magnet for um, goodness. I am a mm -hmm. magnet for um, love and compassion. I'm, mm -hmm. I just, that whole, I'm a magnet for like yeah. insert, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I'm a magnet for this. Like I'm attracting mm -hmm. this to yeah. my life. Mm -hmm. um, so those are pretty much, those are the ones that I, I, you know, I'm a magnet for is mm -hmm. one that I use all the time, you know, yeah. when I'm, I'm finding I'm in a negative place. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the I'm calm and confident. Mm -hmm. So yeah. those are, you know, those are my main go-tos. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of, because you put me on the spot. So I can't think of like, <laughs> no any other one. One of, one of the things I did want to touch upon, though, mm -hmm. um, which, which I talk about in my book, is this, mm -hmm. um, this concept of power, okay? Because, you know, um, one of the things that is, is, um, emphasized in 12 step recovery is this idea of powerlessness, you know, and, and it's so true. Like I, I'm not negating that. I'm not challenging that. I mean, I definitely, when I was in active addiction and, um, you know, even in early recovery, I was in a place of powerlessness. You know, I was powerless over, um, my, my addiction, I was powerless over my son. I mean, there are so many things that we're powerless over, right. Mm -hmm. But we're not powerless over ourselves. Like yeah. we're powerless over, you know, all, other people We're mm -hmm. powerless over other things. But one of the things that I challenge, um, in the, in 
that's a belief of a lot of people in 12 step recovery is that you're always powerless. Like Mm -hmm. that, you you know, and and I don't believe that at all. I believe Mm -hmm. that, you know, the whole, uh, the whole mindset, you know, what what I refer to as spirituality, the whole Mm -hmm. mindset is all about going from this place of powerlessness to a place of power, you know, Mm -hmm. having power, um, creating strength within Mm -hmm. yourself and that there are things that we can do that will deplete us of power and there are things that we can do that will give give us Mm -hmm. more power give us more strength and especially when it comes to addiction recovery it's very essential to be mindful of where you are in terms of that power differential Mm -hmm. now are you thinking in Mm -hmm. ways that are depleting your power you Mm -hmm. know are you doing things that are depleting your power Mm -hmm. and what are the areas in your life where you can you know do things think things um that are going to give you more and more power because Mm -hmm. as long as you have the the proper power differential you know then you're you're not really at risk for picking up a drink or a jug because if you're Mm -hmm. full of like if your true self you know what I call the true self, what some people refer to as the sober self. Mm -hmm. But when my true self is, is really at maximum power in terms of like, I'm feeding myself mentally, Mm -hmm. emotionally, spiritually, physically, then I'm not at any risk for wanting to pick up a drink or a jug. But if Mm -hmm. I start doing things that start to deplete that power, you know, Mm -hmm. whether that's, um, not, you know, not, uh, attending to what's, what's going on in my Mm -hmm. mind, um, engaging in negative emotions, you know, like really like, um, allowing those to kind of take over and then also doing like, we can do things, you know what I mean? Um, that, that take away our power, whether Mm -hmm. that's, you know, doing something that we know is not right or hurting Mm -hmm. somebody or, or whatever, (coughs) excuse me. Mm -hmm. No worries. (laughs) So that's, um, that I just wanted to emphasize Mm -hmm. that, that I have, like, that's what, um, Dr. Hawkins talked about in power versus force. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And (laughs) what's interesting also to me is, um, because sometimes I believe, as you said, people don't realize that they have an addiction because they perhaps do a certain thing. They have a bad habit, but they wouldn't classify that as an addiction. And I would love to ask, like, next to you know substances as alcohol and drugs what are some of the you know a lot of common other addictions that people have perhaps like television i like uh, smartphones video games and all of that yeah that's um the the process addictions are a big one now Mm -hmm. um there's also i mean there's there's so many there's there's gambling there's Mm -hmm. um there's sex there's Mm -hmm. porn there's Mm -hmm. um food, you know, food is, is a big one. And that, you know, a lot of these other addictions too can, um, co-occur with Mm -hmm. substance abuse. So, you know, when, 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 of course I talk about substance abuse, I'm talking about like alcohol and or Mm -hmm. drugs, but food can often be very, um, tied in to Mm -hmm. people's other substance abuse. So for example, if, um, There's, there's often the case where, you know, females will be using certain substances, um, and they'll stay thin. Mm -hmm. And then when they start to to get sober, they, they'll then eat, Mm -hmm. you know, and so they use that as a way to, excuse me, (laughs) as a way to stay thin. Mm -hmm. So because they have this issue with, um, their body image and their appearance, Mm -hmm. It can then um, tie into the the drinking and the drugging, Mm -hmm. and then there's also um, you know there's a there's a close um, link between a lot of sex addictions Mm -hmm. as well and substances. Mm -hmm. So there's um, you can become addicted to just about anything. You can become addicted to to work in an unhealthy Mm -hmm. way. You know Mm -hmm. where you become. Uh, physically unhealthy, where you are sacrificing your relationships in your life, mm-hmm. you know, are, are not healthy because of your addiction to work. I think that you can become addicted to just about anything. And yeah. that the key, the key when it comes to something being classified as an addiction is that 
it is something that is creating problems in your mm-hmm. life yet you continue. So for example, my son, um, one of my sons is, a an um, animator. So he's in school right now in his last year of college for animation. And Mm -hmm. he, so that creates him being on the computer, like, you know, a lot because everything that he does is creating on the computer. And he, um, and he plays games on the computer with his friends and like Dungeons and Dragons and all sorts of uh, different things. And so, you know, he loves that. If he were doing it to the extent that he was then sacrificing friendships or Mm -hmm. he was so obsessed with it that he wasn't taking care of himself physically or, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So you can have something that you're passionate about and Mm -hmm. that you love and that you Mm -hmm. do all the time and it'd be Mm -hmm. totally healthy Mm -hmm. when you start you know, sacrificing relationships Mm -hmm. in your life or personal hygiene or things like that, then you're starting to get crossover more into Mm. it being an addiction. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm, Absolutely. And that's, that's kind of like the next question that I would have is how do you identify, you know, uh, what is an addiction and what is not because, you know, but you basically just answered that by realizing, all right, you know, I'm slacking off at a few other important factors in my life because I do this thing all the time. And it's so important to me that perhaps that is then an addiction. Because I believe that a lot of people never know that they have an addiction. And probably all of us have a few addictions that we are not really aware of that it actually is sort of an addiction. So right. that would be you know interesting to find out like what are some steps you can take to identify what is an addiction actually. And also right. then, and the next step is how to, you know, for, for the people you know that are watching uh, this or uh, you know are listening to this, what would be some steps for them to sort of one, find out what they might be addicted to and two, without perhaps like some things aren't as devastating as alcohol and substance abuse, I believe, right? Uh, But still, how can they take steps in order to recover from that addiction at home without going to like the AA or, you know, other clubs sort of, you know, like that, if that makes sense. Like what Mm -hmm. steps can they take to, to recover at home um, from their addictions? Well, first of all, they, they need to have a willingness, you know, mm-hmm. they have a, have to have a willingness to address it. And so that's what makes addiction so tricky, you know, yeah. because like I, I mentioned earlier, it's one of the only mental illnesses aside from Alzheimer's mm-hmm. where people that have it will deny that they have it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like that, if you've, I used to work with Alzheimer's patients and quite often, not all the time, but quite Mm -hmm. often, if you were to try and have a discussion with an Alzheimer's patient about them having Alzheimer's, they will deny that they have it, you know? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's the same for addiction, um, which is why, you know, um, interventionists are so popular because Mm -hmm. it often takes the family getting together and having this Mm -hmm. intervention with their loved one for them to like snap out of the denial that occurs as a result of addiction. So Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's more often than not that you, that something needs to happen to snap that person out of Mm -hmm. the denial that -hmm. happens. But let's say somebody has the willingness, they realize that, you know, they have an addiction. I mean, I do, I will plug my online program because I have an online program. (laughs) It's called the resilient warrior uh, masterclass. Mm -hmm. And so it is an online program and a community for people who are seeking to overcome substance abuse, Mm -hmm. any kind of um, addiction Mm -hmm. um, and uh, or codependency issues. Mm -hmm. So it it teaches the things that I've been talking about and it teaches like healthy communication and it teaches about addiction and what addiction Mm -hmm. is and what it's not and myths about addiction and Um, and family recovery and healthy communication and spirituality and shame and meditation and you mm-hmm. know, relapse prevention. And it's a whole bunch of modules that people can do from the um, you know, privacy of their own home mm-hmm. on their own. So it's also self-paced. There's not like you have to do you know, yeah. certain, it's meant to be a 12 week program. So it's mm-hmm. meant to be about three months long mm-hmm. um, just to give people kind of an idea of how long it should take them to, to go through the information. Um, but other than, than that, uh, the mindset, 
um, practice that really is going to help somebody to be able to break that addiction mm -hmm. and to be able to, you know, move forward and grow into their best true self, you know, mm -hmm. because the addiction is really taking away from, yeah. from your life, from mm -hmm. your ability to fully experience life. Pre and previously on off off the call, you said that a lot of the addictions obviously give you a dopamine boost. It, they make mm -hmm. you feel good, right? right. And uh, I've been watching a series lately, you know, from a YouTuber who was talking about the root of unproductivity, and where he basically said that a lot of the things that we do give us a lot of dopamine, but they just give us a short boost of dopamine. So for example, if you take a substance, you have a, a you know, very big high boost of dopamine, but then it right. slacks off immensely. And then you are just out of your energy basically, and you don't have a will to do anything else. So right. do you mind sharing a little bit more about uh, this, this topic? Because I, because I believe that for a lot of people watching this, sort of understanding the root cause of unproductivity when it comes to dopamine levels and substance abuse, but also addictions in itself will be very interesting. Well, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I can um, really uh, speak to that mm -hmm. topic, you know, very well. I mean, I'll try mm -hmm. my best in terms yeah. <laughs> of rel because really my, my knowledge is, is really um, more so just geared to mm -hmm. like substance abuse and, addiction and how it affects what I, what is important to understand when it comes to addiction is that, you know, people think people, there are a lot of, um, these, um, businesses out mm -hmm. there now that promote, uh, that promote like harm reduction and, you know, you being able to, uh, you know, just, moderate your drinking or drugging mm -hmm. and <clears throat> you know go from this place of addiction to just being you know just being able to have a few and you'll be yeah. okay you know just learning you just need mm -hmm. to learn mm -hmm. how to moderate and um that is when it when you've crossed over what i call mm -hmm. <clears throat> crossed over into addiction there's really n never any going back to moderating mm -hmm. and that's because of the dopamine load mm -hmm. and that's because your mo your <clears throat> brain has been bombarded with such um a level of dopamine mm -hmm. that um you know i'm not you know a neuro <clears throat> scientist or anything yeah. like that but my my basic understanding mm -hmm. of of the the dopamine impact it, and the reward system is that um once you go through that 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 process of your brain reaching that that level mm -hmm. then once you pick up a drink or a drug it's automatically going to go back to that mm -hmm. level again like it's going to hit that point which creates then the craving mm -hmm. so and i'm probably not explaining this like as well as as That's i fine. should uh -huh. but it's this basic understanding of once your brain hits that certain level mm -hmm. of the dopamine impact then going back and thinking that you can just have like mm. you know one drink or one hit or whatever the the yeah. substance is and and be okay um mm -hmm. is is false mm -hmm. and and so some people say well you know i've been able to moderate you know i was you know abusing and and so what i say to that is well then you didn't your brain, the dopamine mm -hmm. load, didn't cross over into addiction. So maybe yeah. you were abusing substances, yeah. you know, you were, you were having a hard time and you went through this period of abstinence and recovery yeah. and now you're able to moderate. Well, then yeah. you, you didn't cross over into mm. addiction. And mm. so your brain didn't get to this point. Yeah. yeah. But when it comes to like what you're asking about in terms of um, the productivity all I can say about that is that you, you know, you definitely go through this period of post-acute withdrawals mm -hmm. for people who, who experience um, substance abuse and addiction mm -hmm. where you're, um, so this is where you get worse before you get better, so to speak, right? Yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. you go from bombarding your brain with the dopamine and then what happens is that your brain, um, you know, needs a lot of time to heal. So, mm -hmm. um, so how can I put this uh, succinctly? So a lot of people think 
you know, I'll go to treatment for 28 days, I'll go to detox, mm -hmm. I'll be fine, um, and, and jump right back into life. And mm -hmm. so what they don't realize is because you don't see it, it's in our brain, yeah. right? We're, we're mm -hmm. not walking around with a brain scan that shows yeah. like how our brain is functioning. Mm -hmm. and, and so in treatment, I use the example of, you know, if you got hit by a car mm -hmm. and you went to the hospital, you know, the hospital's going to release you as soon as they possibly can. Yep. And when they release you, you're probably going to either be in a wheelchair or you'll have a cast or you'll be on crutches. There'll be something that people can see that you're injured, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. With addiction, you can't see it, mm, right? Yeah. So it's in the brain. Mm -hmm. And what people don't realize is that the brain is healing and there is this, um, there is this, you know, rehabilitation that mm -hmm. needs to happen for months. You know, yeah. post-acute withdrawals happen for up to two years. And wow. what happens with post-acute withdrawals is as the brain is healing, it will, um, it will manifest in symptoms such as um, insomnia, irritability, uh, low stress tolerance, um, cognitive issues mm -hmm. where you can't remember things, you can't remember what you read, you can't remember people's names. So mm -hmm. these things will, will come up. They mm -hmm. usually only last for a couple of days at a time. They're very intermittent, but they'll mm -hmm. be happening for a period of two years. And that's where you, you know, thinking that you're going to go to treatment and then go back to work and be at a hundred percent or go back to taking care of the kids and be at a hundred percent is, is false. It's productivity yeah. issue, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're not going to be able to be as productive mm -hmm. as you were, um, mm -hmm. you know, prior to you becoming addicted. Mm -hmm. And so some people have this false belief that they can just go back to work. They can just go back to, you know, family life and they'll be, um, they'll be able to function as, mm -hmm. as they had in the past. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. Mm, if that, that makes sense. Your yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. And you've also talked about um, cravings a few times, right? And yeah. how do you deal with cravings when you are, you know, in, the process of recovery and obviously you will be having cravings all the time you will be you know seeing people drink and you might be thinking all right you know maybe i can get a drink as well but how can people you know in the process of recovery deal with those cravings like how can they cope with that okay so well the first thing i want to explain is that a big part of relapse prevention you mentioned mm -hmm. like seeing people drink being around mm -hmm. people who drink um Relapse prevention is, I equate it to um, like a minefield. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when you're in recovery and you're going out into the world as this new sober person, right? It's like you're going out into this minefield and there are mines all over the place. And if you don't know where the mines are, then the likelihood that you're going to step on a mine and it's going to blow up your recovery is going to be pretty great. And so the relapse prevention is about identifying where all the mines are, mm. like certain places, mm -hmm. you know, people, situations that you want to be careful of because they could trigger you. They could mm -hmm. create a craving. And what a lot of people don't realize when it comes to cravings is that, um, something that that happens with the neuro connections okay mm -hmm. the neurotransmitters is that when um so when you spend time with people and mm -hmm. you let's just use drinking but it could be drugs or anything and it's more powerful when the more powerful the drug the neuro connection mm -hmm. is that if i've spent a lot of time drinking with someone right and this happened to me over and over again mm -hmm. with the, the the man that i used to date when I first came into recovery is he drank. And so I would say to myself, we're going to go out to dinner. I'm not mm -hmm. going to drink. I'm committed to my recovery. And I meant it wholeheartedly. Like I don't want to drink. I'm committed to my recovery. But what would happen because I spent so much time drinking with him is that these neuro connections were formed in my brain with yeah. him and the mm -hmm. drink. And it didn't take a long period of time of him drinking in front mm -hmm. of me or a chemical release to happen in my brain that yeah. was so powerful, created such a strong craving mm -hmm. that I was like, uh, order me one of those. And he'd mm. be like, um, I thought you weren't supposed to be drinking. And I'd be like, oh, no, I'm okay. That's fine. Mm. But I'll, I'll take one. Yeah. Because of the intense craving that happens. Mm -hmm. So people do not give that enough validity and, and credit mm -hmm. like that this is real and that's what happens. So mm -hmm. 
identifying, you know, those areas is really critical and not putting yourself in that situation. Mm -hmm. But let's say you are having a craving. There's a lot of different things that you can do to help you move through that craving. One of those, of course, is picking up the phone and calling Mm -hmm. somebody and helping them to talk you through Mm -hmm. the craving. Um, Another one can be the the mindfulness if you've mm-hmm. been practicing mindfulness mm-hmm. if you've been practicing mindfulness is like the most um you know it, it just is the most undervalued and yeah. underutilized tool mm-hmm. in all of recovery because mm-hmm. <clears throat> if you've if through the practice of mindfulness becoming that third party observer of self mm-hmm. you're able to then be able to slow down the automatic pilot response. Mm -hmm. You're able to slow it down to such a degree that you can observe what's Mm -hmm. happening in your body. And so to be able to just sit there and ride it out, Mm -hmm. you know, and just observe, you know, as that third party observer of what's going on in your body will help you Mm -hmm. in and of itself to move through. And, And also understanding that when you have a craving, cravings usually don't last longer than 15 to 20 minutes. So just knowing that, like Mm -hmm. knowing, okay, I've got this craving. I just need to ride it out for like Mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes. You can also do things like, you know, take a hot shower, you know, Mm -hmm. take a bath. Um, um, Aromatherapy is good for Mm -hmm. for cravings. So there's all sorts of different Mm -hmm. things that you can do for it. But I would suggest practicing mindfulness is a huge, Mm -hmm. you know, um, will be a huge benefit to being able Mm -hmm. to ride through those cravings. Fantastic. Yeah. And thank you for sharing because I didn't know that cravings only last for like 15 to 20 minutes, because if you know this fact, you know, as you said, if you know that, then you know, all right, I just got to stick it through for 15, 20 minutes and it will get easier. You know, once, you know, once the time has passed basically. Right. Right. And, and Mm -hmm. also that's where mindset can come in to help Mm -hmm. you as well, because it's going, you're going to be able to ride through that craving much better coming from a standpoint of leaning into it than Mm -hmm. being like, you know, start to get like anxious and panicky about it. And Mm -hmm. because being aware again of what's going on Mm -hmm. in your mind, you Mm -hmm. can attach to that craving and feed it in ways that will make it worse. Mm -hmm. for yourself yeah that makes sense all right all right kj we're getting close uh to the end of the interview here and i absolutely loved everything that you shared with uh me here and everything you know with the audience as well and there's always one thing that i love to ask at the end of the interview where i believe that the answers are always very very great in all you know in all sorts of forms and i almost know what you're going to be answering but i'm uh very Mm -hmm. excited for that so if you were to if you were to be able to teach the entire world one concept, one mindset, or one you know thought pattern that they would understand in order to have a positive impact on the whole world, what would it be? It would be mindfulness. Yes, absolutely. I knew it. <laughs> it would be mindfulness. Mindfulness changed my life. I mean, yeah. it absolutely changed my life because with mindfulness, you go from this place of being this passive participant mm-hmm. in life, right? Where yeah. I just allowed things to happen. You know, yeah. I just was this receiver of, you know, everything that was going on in my life, even my, my, um, my thoughts. I mean, yeah. my thoughts were bullying my body and I was allowing it to happen. Mm. I just was this passive participant in it. And mindfulness taught me how to become this active, Mm -hmm. you know, this active participant in observing what was going on in my mind and starting to direct it towards yeah. these areas that were going to actually give me mm. more strength and more power. So I think that mindfulness should be taught from like kindergarten, yes. you know, yes. like the sooner Absolutely. you can start teaching mindfulness, mm-hmm. um, the better. So yeah, yeah, that's definitely my number I, one. I totally agree with you. And, I, and I, that's, that's what I thought you will be answering because I would totally agree that mindfulness and realizing that you create your own reality and the thoughts that you have all the day is, is what is, you know, basically creating the life that you are living from the day-to-day basis. So thank you again for sharing that. Um, Is there anything else you would love to share before we end up this interview here? Well, the only, the only other thing which I've already said is Mm -hmm. just to get out there that, you know, people can not only recover from their experience with addiction, but they Mm -hmm. absolutely can, you know, become better than they ever were before and completely begin to thrive in their life. 
Fantastic. I love that. So if people want to know more about what you do or reach out to you or, you know, find more help in your courses, how can they find you? So there are a couple of different ways. I mean, I'm pretty much under Dr. KJ Foster, Dr. KJ Foster on all the different social media platforms. Um, I have a, a website, drkjfoster.org. I also have a website for um, all of my fostering resilience programs, which are the different online programs and resources that are available. And those can be found at uh, FR program. So for fostering resilience, frprogram.com. Okay, fantastic. All right. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you did, let me know in the comments down below and also make sure to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell so you get notified whenever I upload a new video and come up with a new Your Best Self podcast. So KJ, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and sharing your amazing story and everything that you shared with us today. I really enjoyed it and I bet you have helped a lot of people today. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate fantastic. you having me. <laughs> Have a fantastic day. Have a day. great Bye -bye. day. Bye. Okay, bye.